So good morning, everybody. This is the teaching and learning call for Wednesday, July 1st, 2015. My name is Matthew Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia, and Trisha Gordon is here with me. This is the first time I've facilitated one of these calls, so go easy on me. I'm going to get a whole bunch of stuff wrong. But anything I get right is because of Trisha, who is here kind of <laughs> looking over my shoulder and making sure that I do most things right. So good morning, everybody. Hope you all are having a good day. We have a pretty full schedule today. But the highlight of our schedule today is Jerry Timbrook from the University of Dayton is going to talk a little bit about library e-reservations in Sakai and how they do that. So before we get to that, we're going to take a few minutes for project updates and announcements. So if we have any project reps that are here, do you guys want to talk and give any updates? Um. Yeah, I mean, I could I could speak to them, but I also Wilma's here, and let's see, Louise is not, so I don't know. Wilma, did you want to mention any of the UX stuff, or? Sure. Um, we had our first UX interest group meeting yesterday, so um, and actually, I see a few familiar names on the call today that were at that meeting. So um, we've posted our notes. Unfortunately, I didn't think to record this session, um, but we're planning on having sort of a monthly meeting and then um, we'll send kind of an update out to the, um, the Sakai user and Sakai dev list on just sort of our our notes for that particular meeting. Um, but um, it seemed to be a lot of interest in kind of touching base regularly and having a place to bring um, UX related um, discussion or projects. Um, also, somewhat related to the JIRA for this week, I noticed it was about the, that Samago um, quiz progress panel, which I believe they had asked for some UX feedback on that. So um, we were going to see if maybe um, the UX interest group could organize some sort of a focus group or something around that to, um, to address any sort of um, UX research that people are interested in if they're developing things. So that's kind of where we are with that. And um, I don't have any updates on STEP right now. Work is progressing, um, but we don't have anything new to report on that. And I guess I can uh, jump in with uh, some other things. So yeah, the lesson is the LEAP project. There's nothing, well, I guess the main thing uh, for the LEAP project is that um, Express Labs, which are the folks who did the beautiful wireframes, um, they are working on contributing back the CSS uh, to the central, like Morpheus is like a, the central, Morpheus is the responsive design, but it's also, I think, like a central place for CSS that can be used across um, all the tools in Sakai. And so um, uh, Express Labs is working on contributing, um, which will take on a couple weeks, uh, CSS that will go not to change Morpheus, but like just be a central place so that if other tools like what happens in lessons, they can reuse the same elements in their tools. So that's kind of an interesting development. Um, and that'll be a few weeks away. Um, I haven't seen uh, the gradebook. I'm not sure the exact status of the gradebook enhancement. I think that they plan on committing those big enhancements in the next couple of weeks. And I also have wind of there's um, a community discussion that you'll probably see announced soon for those institutions that are in gradebook two and are thinking about in Sakai 11 moving to gradebook one. I think there's like a community um, effort to have like an online boff, birds of a feather, to have that discussion about, you know, what that might look like. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And let's see. Um, so, uh, Sakai 11, Leap, um, BOF. Those are all the things I can think of at the, at the moment. I have a question. This is yeah. Terry Golightly. Um, David Eagleman and I were talking yesterday about Zoku and what its age is and when it might be ready for beta testing and whatnot. I'm just wondering about getting into the functionality of that kind of tool. Does anybody know about it? I couldn't really hear the question. Did somebody else? Does anybody know about the condition of Xerthi and when it's ready for beta testing and when it, or integration or whatever? We're just kind of interested in gaining that functionality. I see that Julian is here listening and he says that Xerthi is ready for beta testing. 
Okay. So Dave Evelyn at Johnson and I would be interested in talking about that. Okay, and Julian also says you can get the code if you're interested in the code from GitHub or from zerti.org.uk in the download section there. Can you post that? I see it. Okay. So thank you, Julian, for that. Also, uh, Zerti is presenting on this call next Wednesday, so that might be another opportunity to um, hear more about what's going on. I knew that was coming up soon, but we had just been talking about it yesterday, and I told Dave I'd ask about it. No, that's great. Thank you, Terry. Well, that's great. Thank you, Wilma, and thank you, Neil, for those updates. Anybody else want to give any other updates before we move on? Um, I just remembered one other update. Uh, the Sakai Virtual Conference planning team is just getting started, so we're going to get ready to start organizing another virtual event um, for sometime this fall. Um, so if anybody is interested in joining the planning team, please let me know. And um, our next, our first meeting is next week, so um, hopefully you can make the time that we've scheduled, but if not, um, you can always catch up later and uh, and join the team at any point if you're interested in helping out. What's the date and time for your first meeting? Let me double check. Hang on one second. It is Thursday the 9th at 11 Eastern. Okay, thanks. Okay, so before we move on to the JIRA of the week, Jerry asked if he could have just a couple minutes to talk about and give some updates on some of the custom enhancements that they're working on at Dayton. So, Jerry, if you want to go ahead and take five minutes and do that now, that'd be great. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so, at the Sakai conference, we had a couple of presentations on some customs that we did. And the first teaching and learning meeting back, um, folks were asking for the status of contributing those back to the community. So I figured uh, I would take a couple seconds just to talk through. I think I have five tickets for you. And the first one is um, the Samago question progress panel. Oh, it looks like my slides have been formatted in big blue button a little strange. So sorry about that. And I know that that's actually the JIRA of the week. So I'll just quickly say that the code review of that is complete um, and we're awaiting the UX input right now, which Wilma mentioned. So um, hopefully that'll be upcoming. So that is actually out there. And if anyone wanted to grab it from Git, also available in that ticket. Uh, we also worked on a roster tool modification. So if you look to the right of the student names, um, this would be the first page of the roster tool. We added the last visit of a student and then the total number of visits through the semester in the roster tool. And that is currently merged and in trunk. So that is good to go. Anybody who wants to grab that, that's good. I think Oxford actually um, did some great work on this because we used a custom service in order to make this work. So Oxford kind of used the uh, stuff that's behind site stats in order to make it work a little bit easier for the rest of the community. So kudos to Oxford for doing that. And we also made some schedule tool modifications. So we gave a talk on, uh, we ran a student usability focus group that was about uh, six hours long actually. And one of the big findings was that um, the schedule tool was something that students really enjoyed using despite the fact that we didn't think that anybody was using that here. So they made some suggestions to make the schedule tool look more like um, the Google calendars list view. So we made a couple tweaks to the schedule tool and um, that's currently available in uh, 29497 and Oxford is currently merging that in. So Laura, I'm gonna jump back to the roster tool. Uh, it says, read the roster tool. How much of information is visible to students? Yeah, the student view does not include that last visit, total visit. That would be an instructor view only. So we, we still made sure that all of that stuff is uh, FERPA compliant there. So that's only visible to the instructor role. 
So this was um, a really interesting request. So we, our university had been on Gradebook 2 for a long time, which had the ability to weight items equally within a category, regardless of a point value. So if you had an item that was worth 10 points and an item that was worth 20 points, if you had this setting enabled, all items would be worth the same amount despite their point value. And when uh, we started moving away from Gradebook 2 back to Gradebook 1, we found that there was this whole, we had a lot of faculty who were using that feature, so we had to write back in the ability to do equal weighting within a category. Um, so this particular ticket is not going to be a part of Trunk. Um, I think a lot of folks in the community didn't really see the, the need for this. Um, we struggle with this a lot. If you want things to be equal, why wouldn't you just make them worth an equal number of points? But we had some trouble with faculty who didn't want to do things that way. So we went ahead and wrote this in. And uh, really, here's a screenshot from the interface. But the, the gist is you can select to the right of a category that you would like to weight things equally in that category. So this is a ticket for uh, Gradebook 1. And um, it allows you to weight items equally within that category. So if that's something that anybody is interested in, that is out there. But again, it's not going to be a part of Trunk. And then finally, um, we worked on uh, Samago Extra Credit. So, oh, I actually don't think it made it to the screen. So it, it cut off the bottom part. But uh, right below this image there, um, there is the ability to click that this question is extra credit so um, that you wouldn't have to have a question that counted against a student if they missed it. So the pull request has been entered for that, but it's not yet merged. So uh, those are the five tickets that we have um, that are out there right now. And those are ones that people were asking about from the conference. So that's where we are. Thanks a lot, Matt. Awesome, Jerry. Thank you very much for that. And Jerry has also offered to be our point person and answer any questions about the JIRA of the week that we're going to talk about this week. And I will go ahead and paste that JIRA number into the chat for those of you who haven't already seen it. It's SAM2586, which is add side panel to track question progress. So this is something that I think Jerry and the University of Dayton actually initiated. So if you guys have questions, if you all want to discuss this, Please feel free to come on the mic or post them in the chat, and Jerry can answer them because he's a genius. <laughs> oh, Jerry, could you tell us the status of this? I think you mentioned it already, but um, can you explain more about what this uh, feature does? Sure thing. I, I'd be happy to talk you through it. So um, if anybody remembers back uh, who might have had WebCT, they had this side panel that listed out every single question number, kind of like a table of contents. Um, and it exists to the right of a question inside of Samago. And you have the ability to click. So if I wanted to click this three right here, even if I were in section one, I could jump from this question in section one to this question in section two or any other question. Not only that, but um, even though it got cut off a little bit here, there are different icon indications. So if you've answered a question, this bubble would get colored in. So that way you could have a visual representation of the questions that were answered to you. And also, if you uh, marked a question for review, there would be a question mark in the circle. So if you marked question number 13 for review and made it all the way down to question 61, you could still see that question 13 was marked for review. And just by clicking it, you could pop back to it. Does that answer your question there, Tricia? Yeah. And so is there, to, to get the side panel, do you have to enable mark for review, or does it just appear? Uh, so currently, there's um, only one um, sort of criteria that you have to have, and that is that it is one question per page. This does not work currently if you have, uh, you know, 20 questions per page or if an entire part with multiple questions is on a page. So in its current iteration, it only works one question per page. And then if that condition is met, it automatically happens. Okay. So Jerry, we have a couple of questions in the chat. First, just a general question from Salwa. 
Should we contact you if we're interested in these custom enhancements that you guys are contributing back, or how should we contact people about sure. those? So, so if you look at the ticket, uh, SAM2586, there should be um, a link to Git that has the code right there. Um, and if you would like to grab it and take it for a spin in its current iteration, that's something that you're absolutely free to do. Um, so I'm checking to see where exactly it might be here. And if it's not in there, I would be more than happy to send um, folks a link to where it is in Git. Um, so you can shoot me an email if you are interested. And then also a more specific question from Terry, how would this work in a quiz randomly drawn from a question pool? So this is actually built similar to the uh, table of contents that's already in there. So it, it would work for a, a quiz randomly drawn from a question pool. Again, as long as that one condition of um, having one question per page is met. But the individual questions are not numbered when you go to the question pool. But they say, say that one more time. When you when you go into the question pool, like to add to it or to edit it or whatever, the questions are not numbered. I get so this is the question progress panel only appears to students as they're actually taking an exam. Okay. So at, at that point, once the exam has been has pulled the questions from a question pool, you do have question numbers. OK, but they wouldn't be the same from one student to the next. Correct. That's exactly right. And again, this is just a tool for students to use through navigation of their own instance of that quiz. OK, thank you. Good question. Great. Thanks, Terry, for that question and Jerry for that answer. And thanks, Neil, for providing additional info for people who are interested in taking a look at this and taking a look at the links. Any other questions or comments about the JIRA of the week before we move on and Jerry gets started? All right, well, I don't see any, so Jerry, why don't you take it away? Jerry's going to have 30 minutes to talk a little bit more about library e-reservations in Sakai and how they're doing it at Dayton. Great, thanks Matt. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my desktop here since it looks like my slides are getting cut off slightly. So let's see if I can do that here. Are you guys able to see my uh, desktop okay? Just the slides? <clears throat> I'm not seeing anything different yet. Okay, give me one second here. All right, I can't quite get it to go, so we'll see if I can get the slides to look okay here. So um, this presentation, it definitely won't last 30 minutes, but um, uh, its intended purpose is to give you an overview of how we have implemented electronic course reserves via Sakai at the University of Dayton. And um, I welcome questions as I go through here, so feel free just to jump in if you have a question about the process or the infrastructure that um, I'm gonna describe here. But this is something that we implemented uh, back in about 2011 in order to uh, help out with a couple of problems we were having with our old e-reserve system. So as a quick caveat, I did want to mention that UD is a mid-sized university, um, and this solution might not be as simple if you do have a lot of students, a lot of uh, course reserves if you're a larger institution. I do have some thoughts on how you could implement that and how you could scale it up. Um, so if you wanted to have that conversation maybe afterwards or offline an email or something like that, we would be very open to that. But just as a quick caveat, we are a mid-sized university um, and this solution does work for us but might present a couple of problems that you would need to work around if you were uh, a larger institution. 
So um, in general, we use our e-reserve system to make digital learning artifacts, so like videos, uh, journal articles, things like that, available to students in a particular course section. And this process is managed by a course reserve specialist who is housed in the library, and it's supported by the e-learning staff, so the folks that actually uh, deal with the learning management system on a day-to-day -day basis. And all of this is handled via Sakai here, and it replaced a system that we had that was called DocuTech. And uh, the reason that we moved away from DocuTech is because the amount of use that we were seeing for it didn't justify the cost that we were paying for it. So um, because Sakai is a tool that we have that doesn't carry a cost for that sort of thing, it was the best solution for us. So that's why we moved away from our old solution to this one. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like from a student perspective before I get into the nitty gritty, I wanted to show you a screenshot um, of what the student view of this would look like. So right now I'm logged into Sakai as a student. And if you take a peek there, they have a tab called e-reserves. So they'll have their typical um, chemistry philosophy courses. And then if they didn't want to get into those, but specifically needed to pull um, those documents, they go to a completely separate course site called e-reserves. So once they've clicked that, they're popped into a site. And the first thing that they see is this image that we have populated. And it walks the students through the instructions on how to access their materials. And it's a pretty simple process. We've renamed the resources tool in this site to e-reserves. So they give that a click. And once they do that, they're taken to the resources tool and all of their materials organized per the instructor's request are there. So you can tell that this one is in alphabetical order. So they're able to download or if there is a file structure um, that is also implemented as well. So that's what that looks like from the student perspective. As far as the infrastructure goes, uh, each semester, a new e-reserves course site is created. And a little bit later in the presentation, I'll get into why we have to create a new e-reserves course site each semester. But once the um, e-learning staff creates that at the beginning of the semester, the course reserve specialist is then added as an instructor since they're the one that's gonna be managing that process. And then we make sure to publish that site on the first day of the semester. And then at the end um, of the semester, once grades are due, we go ahead and rehide that site so students lose access to that material. So I'm gonna go over the workflow from when the faculty initiates the request all the way until a student can actually access it. So we have, um, uh, actually Terry, uh, I'll give you the quick answer to that. We don't use project sites at UD. So that would be the answer to why we don't use, we use a course site over a project site. So there you go. The benefit of the recording, Terry's question was, is there an advantage to making this a course site rather than a project site or a collaboration site? Perfect, thank you, Matt. So the, this whole process is initiated by a faculty request to have e-reserves implemented in their course. And we have an online request form but we also have um, a paper request form as well. So faculty are welcome to do that either way. And they would fill out some basic information, um, their name, email address, what course it is, all that good stuff where they can be contacted. So once that's done, our course reserve specialist goes out and gathers those artifacts from the faculty. So they submit their materials to the course reserve specialist. And sometimes those are already digitized, but sometimes they are hard copies. And so the folks in the library use their optical um, character recognition scanners to make sure that all of the documents that we put in are accessible. Um, and we get all of those materials together. And then once those are together, the course reserve specialist does um, uh, a review for copyright clearance. So as a part of the uh, form that I showed you on the last page, there is a place where the faculty have to certify that they are in compliance with copyright law. And um, a big piece of this process is education about um, what faculty should be doing. 
And our course reserve specialist uh, made a point to tell me that uh, she sees her job and she's also been told that her job is not about giving advice because we're not legally allowed to give advice about copyright. So what we do is just provide education. So we say here are, um, you know, what you can do as far as fair use. Here is basically the court cases that are involved. Um, and here are the resources that you can use in order to obtain copyright clearance. So we do try to make sure that they have, uh, if it's a journal article, there's an email from the publisher or they've listed We lost your audio, Jerry. Not sure what happened. Can you guys still hear me okay? There we go. Now you're back. What was the last thing you heard? Uh, let's see. You were talking about if there were journal articles uh, that they were cleared for copyright or that they had a note from the publisher. Yep, there you go. Okay. So if they're using something like journal articles that we have uh, either an email or if the journal itself says you can use so many copies uh, of a particular item for um, a course section, we just have all of that information ready to go. So we also, um, there's this image here from Copyright Clearance Center. So if you have a book um, or another article, you can actually type that in and it'll give you the publisher information so you can easily contact that publisher to get copyright clearance. Do you guys have any questions about that copyright process? I know that can kind of be sticky for some folks. All right. So the next step, um, once we make sure that all the materials are there, we start creating the structure inside the e-reserve site for that particular course section. So the course reserve specialist then will go into the site into site info and add the instructor to the site as a teaching assistant. And then once that part is done, we add the course roster to the site. So the reason that we add them as a teaching, the instructor as a teaching assistant before we add the course roster is if they were added with just the roster, the instructor would have instructor privileges in that site. And this prevents them from getting access to be able to fidget with other course sections e reserve. So this way we can say, even though they are an instructor in the course, they don't have superpowers in the e-reserves site. And then I'm sure a question on a couple of your minds right now is, well, doesn't that mean that every single time the course reserve specialist adds a roster to the site, that the e-learning staff would have to deal with manual roster approval? And so for that reason, we actually have a very quick custom that we did called the roster requester group. So we have this special role inside of our instance of Sakai that's a little bit higher than um, a normal user, but definitely lower than an admin. So we can put people in this group and allow them, whenever they submit um, a request to put a roster in a course site, it's automatically approved. So the course reserve specialist is added to this special group. So the only difference between their normal instructor powers and the folks in this group is that whenever they request to put a roster in a course site, no one has to touch that manually on the learning management system side. So if you're interested in that, feel free to contact me for those details. Um, we have those changes that we could give you no problem. So once the roster is added, you go into resources and you add a folder. And um, the nomenclature that we use is the last name of the professor and then the course, but you, you could do that any way that you see fit. And the other important part of this is making sure that you display that folder and its contents to selected groups only, and then make sure to tick off the section of the roster that's supposed to be seeing this particular group of resources. Once that folder is created, we do WebDAV um, in, in order to upload the digital artifacts. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but WebDAV and all of its various clients have been a little finicky for us over the years. So recently we found that the web edition of any client is working out okay for us. Um, I know some people are using CyberDuck. So if anyone has any good recommendations on a great web dev client, we would be very happy to hear that. But uh, that's what we're using right now. And then finally, um, the last step is to inform the student and let them know, um, typically from the instructor, how um, they're going to be accessing their e-reserve. So if, whether or not it's a syllabus blurb or the faculty actually um, tells them on the first day of class or if they have it you know, somewhere else in their course site, that's how they would handle it.
So a question that uh, some folks might be having right now is why don't professors just add files to resources in their own course site? Why do you need this separate e-reserves functionality, this separate e-reserves course site? So our answer to that, uh, the first one is not all faculty at the University of Dayton use Sakai or have Sakai sites. It's not required here. Um, we do have about 85 to 90 percent of our faculty using Sakai, um, but there are still some that don't use it. And whether or not that's because they don't want to or because they haven't had the time to learn it, a lot of times we get uh, adjunct faculty who are hired maybe right before the first day of class and we don't have the time to allow them uh, to learn how to use it. So it, it's just a, a separate way that we have of making those resources available. And also it allows us to ensure that copyright clearance. So if we know that people are going to be sharing some potentially copyrighted material out, we have a little bit of a check in there to make sure that everybody is uh, conforming. And then finally, the best part of this is it also allows for reporting of usage statistics via the site stats tool. So um, if you pop into the site stats tool, which is again hidden to everyone but the course reserve specialist, you can see exactly how many times a particular document has been accessed, which is uh, really nice for if, again, like I mentioned before, um, if you have a document that can only be viewed a certain number of times, that way you can keep tabs on that. Or if you wanted to do a summative report at the end of each semester. So Tricia, you're asking about, uh, yes, this, the question is, is this the only way you make e-reserves available to faculty and students? So this is electronically the way that we did it. Once we moved away from DocuTech, there was a period where we had both DocuTech and um, the e-reserve site. Two semesters where we had them concurrently running. And my course reserve specialist says that there were two semesters where we had them concurrently running. Um, and once that was done, we went to Sakai for e-reserves only. Now, we still do physical um, reserves in the library itself, but this is the only way that electronic reserves are taken care of. So, um, of course, there is a drawback to the Sakai approach, and that is site info becomes incredibly slow when you have a lot of rosters added to it. And again, this is why I kind of threw that caveat there at the beginning um, that larger institutions might not benefit as much from this approach, because if you have hundreds and hundreds of rosters that you're going to need to add to the site, I would say that it could get unusable um, if the course reserve specialist was trying to manage it. Now, we definitely have some thoughts on how to deal with that. And if you are a larger in institution that's interested, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about what those thoughts are. Um, but we create that new course site each semester to mitigate it. So again, every fall, every spring, and every summer, we have a different e-reserves course site created. And Terry, that's, uh, Terry suggests that you could break them down by school or department, and that was absolutely probably my top suggestion for what you could do. So good thinking there. Great minds. Jerry, could you give us just an approximation of how many courses are using this site in any particular semester? So we know, um, I can tell you the number of professors. I have that information off the top of my head. It's, it's between 55 and 60 professors at UD. And then Laura Sierra has another question. How do you get around the quota limitations in the resources folder? So we have actually um, allowed, we've upped that limitation in all of our Sakai sites. So I believe we allow two gigs per site right now. And it might even be higher. It's one of those things that the, the bar keeps freezing. Um, but our, our file server is pretty robust. So um, that, that was a request that we had put in, I would say, uh, probably right before we did this to up that limit for all sites, not just um, the e-reserves version of the sites. And uh, so that, that's basically the, the workflow and how we do it here. But again, if you guys have any more questions, we would be happy to field those. That's awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Any other questions, comments for Jerry? Ah, so Leah jumped in with a better answer to Laura's question. Um, so if Laura was asking, how do you get around the ability to only upload 250 megs at a time, Leah says that you can get around that by using WebDAV. So that limitation is not there if you WebDAV in. And I know that people have been asking about WebDAV clients, and Jerry had mentioned some WebDAV clients. And I see a comment here in the chat from Neil that transmit is good but is not free, unlike some others like CyberDuck. 
I see Dave also commenting that CyberDuck is good, which is also what we use here at UVA or what we recommend the most at UVA. We recommend CyberDuck, also any client. And there was a while that CyberDuck was only available either on Windows or on Mac, but now it's available on both operating systems. So, um, yeah, definitely CyberDuck is a great recommendation. Another weird thing about CyberDuck that actually we just noticed when we were helping a user this week is that if you try to download it through the Mac App Store, if you're downloading it for Mac, it costs $24. But if you download it from their website, it's free. Oh, that's so just really good to, to know. Be, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to point out that Neil just mentioned that we should not be able to get around Sakai quotas by using WebDAV. So um, that might be a ticket that we need to lock. Well, it's two different things. Quota is how much um, storage is available to that site. That right. has, and then the file size limit, upload limit, is the WebDAV solution. So that's. So, Neil, are you saying that we shouldn't be able to get around the file size upload limit? Um, yeah, I mean, you can, as uh, there, there's, uh, you can configure what your quotas are, but you shouldn't be able to get around them. Like, you shouldn't have be able to get, I don't think you should be able to get around the quota that you set, uh, that you can put in resources through the user interface and somehow just get around that through using um, the web dev tool, because the quota should apply no matter how you get the data into Sakai. And um, that would actually be a potential, yeah, that would be a potential. Actually, I thought that had been a bug in the past, and then it got fixed. So I was kind of surprised to, uh, to see that. And, and again, that, that's only to get around the uh, individual upload limit of 250 megs, not to get around that 2 gig upper limit that we have, if that helps at all. Oh, OK. I mean, I might be misunderstanding something, but uh, that's how I thought. I thought it was, you know, you set your individual quota file size limit, and, and it should still enforce that, even with WebDAV, is what I, how I thought it should behave. Yes. And uh, actually, we've bumped ours up to 6 gigs. That's what it is. So I just opened up a site, and uh, it's uh, 6 gigs. For the file size or for the overall? Um, for our overall, our upper limit, our quota. And Wilma noted in the chat that you can bump up the resources quota in an individual site if needed, and that is something that we have done here at UVA, for example, on request for faculty members. So that is something that you can do. You can raise the quota in an individual site. And just as a benchmark, I pulled up our e-reserve site from last fall, and uh, we had about one gig of information there. And like I mentioned, about 55 to 60 professors. So again, that could just be an artifact of our particular faculty group. But we, we've never really come close to that six gig. Um, and Tara, you had asked, how does my librarian contact you? So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, type out my email address here. It's jtimbrook1 at udayton.edu. And you'll also notice Leah Bergman is in the chat. Uh, she's my counterpart here. And she is lbergman1 at udayton.edu. Either one of us would be more than happy to help you or to speak with your librarian about the possibility of implementing that at your local university. And Laura Sierra just made a comment in the chat about what they do, that their library has their own e-services page that links to their Sakai instance by course site. And each course site has its own e-reserves web content link that's then plugged into the Sakai site. Oh, Laura, do you know where those files actually live? That, that's a really interesting approach. Are, are they on a server somewhere else controlled by the library? Laura says that they are at the library. And um, I, again, this, this just could be the way that our university is set up, but I, I think that they don't have the IT ability to um, put that up on their own. So and an, another side effect of us being a, a mid-sized university is they were able to use our IT resources so they didn't have to come up with their own hardware solution. And Laura, since you guys do things a little differently, and Jennifer's already asked for your contact information, do you mind putting your email in the chat so that if people are interested in learning more about different approaches, they can contact you? If 
Thanks, Laura. And I'll just mention, um, so we approached this a uh, slightly different way as well. Um, we, um, the library had their own server where they uploaded the um, PDFs that they generated from scans. And uh, we created a site for them with special permissions to create a, a folder and upload those files to an instructor's My Workspace resources. And from there, the instructor could copy or move those files into their own course sites. Although I, I, I must say I like Jerry's approach because that allows the um, library to better manage the copyright um, information. So that's really nice. It doesn't put the burden as so much on the faculty member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Laura says that they're spoiled at Notre Dame because they handle reserves on their own website. They manage the copyright part for the faculty. Any other questions or comments for Jerry? I just got kicked out there for a second, so sorry if I missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I have Miss Terry Willardley. I have a question about um, making sure that faculty are compliant with this system. How they don't go off the reservation, so to speak, and just kind of throw something in there that you haven't checked the copyright on, or that goes past the copy limit, or whatever. Terry, I was having some trouble hearing you there. Did, did anyone else hear Terry's question? I can repeat it. How do you oh, thank you. how do you enforce compliance with the faculty not going off the reservation when you've got all these procedures that they're supposed to follow, but then they just throw out something there anyway that hasn't gone through the copyright screening and whatnot? So um, if it's in their individual course site, in their own resources tool, there's not a whole lot we can do because then we'd have to monitor every single faculty's uh, resources tool. Um, yeah. so, so it's a little bit difficult to be a, a police person in that respect, but at least in the e-reserve site itself, um, it allows our course reserve specialist who's had a lot of training on copyright issues to um, act as the, the barrier between what does go out and what doesn't. And plain and simple, if there isn't copyright clearance for it, it won't go on to the e-reserve site. But, but like you mentioned, Terry, it doesn't prevent them from finding a, another way of getting that out there, even if they were just to email it to their students. There's nothing we can do that about that either. Are they um, administratively required to go through the e-reserve system? or No, the e-reserve system is completely optional. Okay. It's just the convenience factor of them not having to upload things or digitize things themselves. Okay. Thank and uh, our course reserve specialist is definitely, she's available beyond the e-reserve stuff. She, she does um, talk to people about copyright outside of e-reserves too. So that's a resource that we have on campus kind of in general. Thank you. Absolutely. And Fawe notes in the chat that it's interesting to hear about this approach, organizing files, resources, adding embedding files on a page in Sakai, because they have just started to get away from this approach by focusing on pages rather than files and resources when they're constructing a Sakai site. Fawe, by pages, you, do you mean lessons? Hi, I've, uh, my my microphone just was just caught uh, cut off for a few seconds. Um, can you repeat your question again, please? Uh, by pages, do you mean lessons? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we have been um, we have been um, doing exactly the similar thing as we described here in the past. We always recommend people to use the resources tool because this is the most frequent tool um, the people had been using in the past. Uh, but since the lessons tool was introduced, we realized we are still in the process of refining and uh, exploring 
this too. Uh, sorry about the background noise. Um, we realized. Oh, I'm just, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. We realized actually, um, uh, focusing on the resources too might not be the best approach. The reason is, um, the pay. I mean, even when we before we had lesson two, what we did is like look at the resources and then upload it from your computer to resources and then organize the folder in resources folder or folders and then you add the file to the relevant tools or pages, uh, the home page or the forums or the assignment or uh, you know sometimes we add web links uh, to allow the students to access to all the files in resources area and we're thinking the, the the front end actually the 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 the, the area or the pages the students focusing on is the page is the is the the two itself the page is not the resources the resources and the files are just something uh, as a, as a, how can I say it's like a it's content where it's from uh, so with the lessons too we realize we we've, we've been working on with a couple of departments to focus on the page because this is what the students can say and this is they should make effort and uh, spend time uh, on to design and to think about it to organize um, so I'm just in the process of uh, developing couple size deliberately without even adding the resources to to the site see how it goes and and uh, you know I didn't realize actually the lessons to create folders. I mean, basically, I didn't use the resources to at all. Uh, after about two or three months, um, I had been using the lessons too. So um, I'm just experimenting with this uh, new approach and getting feedback from the faculties here. Um, so we, we only just started to think about that. So I'm be happy uh, to talk about and to report the feedback from our users, I, I think probably in a couple of months time, if the uh, people on this um, group um, are interested. Thanks, Bawe. Those are really interesting comments in the chat. Terry agrees that she thinks the students should get away from the resources tool, but it is a handy place to store files away from students and that she hides it in many cases and perhaps uses lessons or uses another tool as a course portal. I think the course portals are a really great way to focus students and to guide them through the content in a great intellectual flow. I think that also the things that Jerry suggested could be a very helpful supplement for your faculty that don't necessarily use Sakai or don't regularly use course sites in a semester. I know we have people at UVA that only use them for administrative functions. And so, you know, this might be a great way for them to continue delivering content with, without them having to create a separate course site that they wouldn't regularly use or maybe know how to use. That, that's exactly right from our perspective, Matt. Like everyone else is saying, we um, encourage all faculty to use the lessons tool in order to organize their content and to provide context for that content when delivering it. But we do have those cases where they just don't have a course site or aren't interested in using Sakai in general, but still would like to make things available electronically. So yeah, everybody's right on the money there. And Neil reminds us that the Morpheus meeting starts in this room at 11, so we should probably go ahead and move on to talk a little bit about some future meeting themes and topics. I say that next week, July 8th, we're going to have a presentation from Xerti, and Julian Tenney is going to be here and is going to lead that presentation. I saw that he had to get off the call earlier, but I know that he is going to be here, and I'm very excited about that. For those of you who got to see them at the conference, they're doing some really interesting stuff, and I'm sure that's going to be a great presentation. On July the 15th, we have a presentation from OpenCast that's scheduled, although I see that Lars is listed there with a question mark. Just for his last name. Oh, just for his last <laughs> name, and not because there's a question about his appearance. So right. Lars will definitely be here, and there will be a presentation about OpenCast. I see that we have an opening on July the 22nd. Yep. Sorry. We do not have an opening on July the 22nd. I just totally lied to you. Trisha sandbagged me. 
We have big blue button. And we're going to have a demonstration about big blue button on July the 22nd. Blindside. And people from Blindside are going to be leading that. Um, we have, it looks like we have topics through August 5th, actually. So um, we're looking for um, topics into August. So does anybody have anything that they've been thinking about that might be on their mind that they might want to consider or ask questions about or suggest for later in August? Always says he's happy to share uh, with teaching and learning about the new approaches that they're doing if people are interested. Uh, Fawei, do you have a particular date in August that you might be interested in? For example, August the 12th or August the 19th? Do either of those work for you? It would be better probably by end of August, if possible, please. Okay. So. Um, yep. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, this is Tricia, and um, I know that Matt and I are going to be consumed with back-to-school activities at the end of August, August 26th, uh, for example. Um, I don't know what other people's schedules are like, but I was actually going to propose that we skip that week. <laughs> 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 or, but you all could certainly meet without us. Or beginning with September, I, I don't have uh, any particular date, uh, which I'm, you know, okay. I haven't p planned anything yet. <laughs> I'm quite flexible. And Laura Sierra says that Notre Dame will also be very busy from the third week in August. So maybe sometime into early September. Yeah, sounds good to me. September. Okay, um, so maybe September the 2nd. Fawai, does that sound good to you? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We will put Fawai down for September the 2nd. All right. Thanks. What What is the actual topic, Fawai? I just want to try to capture that. I haven't, uh, uh, I haven't organized anything. What I'm thinking is just try to share with you our uh, new approach uh, I briefly discussed earlier and how the faculty react to this new approach and our um, uh, our thinking process and uh, yeah, just share this general approach uh, because um, we realized the lesson to really change the landscape of uh, developing our sites. And uh, I mentioned briefly in the previous call, um, we are in the process of working with 10 to 20 uh, departments to improve their Sakai presence and uh, we we yeah we we are experimenting with with, with this, this approach and we think the lesson to the future and uh, that's why you might have noticed I ask so many questions on the Sakai user list uh, about the lessons to uh, which I believe a lot of people are interested are uh, a lot of people you know think th this is a very useful tool for designing a, a Sakai site so I haven't got a, a very um, concrete uh, title yet. Uh, but okay. I will uh, be happy to, to share uh, before the, I mean, like middle of August or before end of August. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. We've okay. got you down for September 2nd. All right. Thanks. Trisha and Matt, this is Jerry at UD again. Um, I was just talking to my colleague, and we have an idea for the 12th, if you guys would be interested. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so we actually run um, a cohorted program for faculty called the eLearning Fellows Program. And it's ELF for short, unfortunately. Um, so the, <laughs> the basic premise of it is we have faculty come um, and sit through a class with our eLearning department over the course of a semester. And the purpose of this is to transition faculty from um, teaching a face-to-face -face course. So the a prerequisite is they have a course that they've taught face-to-face and we transition it to a fully online or a hybrid course with them. So they learn how to become their own uh, quasi-instructional designers and they learn best practices for pedagogy, um, you know, including instructional design and actually delivering the course. 
And we have a rubric that we've developed as a part of that program. So they have milestones uh, throughout the year that they have to reach um, in order to accomplish that. So we'd be happy to talk about what, what we cover in those uh, each of those sessions and some of the, the deliverables that are required as a part of that program. That sounds great. Trisha is grinning and nodding her head very vigorously. So that would be oh. great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so um, that would be a, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. And Laura Sierra says they're very interested in Notre Dame, too, and I'm sure a lot of other schools are also. So we'll put you guys down for August the 12th. Does that sound well, good? Again, not to take all of the slots that you guys have. So if anyone else has an idea, feel free to take that as well. First come, first serve, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so for the rest of you guys, if you just want to keep thinking about topics, maybe make notes of things that occur to you when you're sitting in meetings or working on stuff, and we will continue to fill out slots for later this summer and now moving into the fall semester. So unless anybody has any final comments, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up this meeting and get out of here. And Salwa does note in the chat that she's added a page on Confluence so that we can collect ideas on how faculty members or anybody can organize content and lessons. This is a great idea. And Salwa has added the link in the chat. So please take a look at that and add your own thoughts there. Thanks, Salwa. So thank you guys, everybody, for a great meeting. I'll go ahead and stop the recording now, and we hope to see you right here next week.